Well, Peter Loosemore, we haven't actually picked the best weather, but we're here now at this fabulous mill, a very, very ancient property indeed. Um, Peter, your history goes back a very long way with this mill. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, I was uh, I'm looking for a job about 20 years ago, and um, I suddenly saw a small advert in a local paper which said they wanted someone to look after Sturminster Mill, and uh, my grandfather was the miller here for all his life. Yeah. So um, it seemed to me uh, perhaps I'd give it a go, and I, kn I knew nothing about milling, but I applied for the job, and luckily they gave me the post. Well, I should think so, because I think in, in the family blood, really. But roughly how long has this mill been here on the side of this river? As far as we're aware, this mill has been here for 999 years at the moment. Um, it was given to the Abbot of Glastonbury by King Edmund Ironside in 1016. So we're pretty sure that um, the... Uh, the, the King of Wessex wouldn't have given the, one of the richest abbeys in the country a load of old peasant huts, so I'm pretty sure, and others agree with me, that there would have been a manor house here and the mill and so on. And uh, it's certainly verified by the Doomsday Book some 70 years later. Well, this is an absolutely massive, massive body of water. And of course, the River Stour, um, over the years, it's, it's been used so many times in so many different ways. Milling, one of the main industries here for a long time, though, along these riverbanks. The big question is, with such a huge force of water, particularly when you get weather like we have at the moment, how do you build a mill that will withstand it? How does it actually all work? Uh well, building a mill was, I suppose, something of a mystery, really. Um, one has to remember that the mill's been here for uh, certainly over a thousand years, and how on earth they managed to dam this force of water in those days with uh, the, none of the modern mechanics that we have is, uh, quite, uh, is open to speculation, I think, at the very least. But um, this is uh, quite a strong flow today, but sometimes it flows much, much stronger than this, and we could even be here up to our necks in water on, on a very um, flooded uh, winter day. But the river flows pretty steadily all through the summer. Um, the, the very fact that it's called the Stour, I believe, means strong, meaning that uh, it was a strong flowing river, and uh, so it went on flowing all through the summertime. We very rarely use all the water that's coming down here, and this uh, um, huge amount of water which is bypassing us at the moment uh, really is extra to our needs. Everything here is spare as far as we're concerned. We use a very, very small amount of water coming in through the corner right over behind us. Well, that's really where we want to start, isn't it? To have a look to see how this whole structure works, how the mill has evolved from those very early days, hundreds of years ago, nearly a thousand years ago. So can we go and have a look inside the machine itself? We can indeed, yes. yes. So we're going to start with one side, but I believe this was actually two mills originally as well. That's right. The part which is closest to us here was originally a fulling mill for working a type of cloth called swan skin. And that was woven in the local cottages here, brought down here to be fooled. In other words, uh, big trip hammers operated by the water power beat the cloth and broke up the fibres, made it softer and so on. And uh, most of the cloth here, uh, the swan skin, was exported to the, for the very early days of the cod fishing industry in Newfoundland. So it was shipped across to Newfoundland. Um, Do you know... Peter, the more you say, the more riveting it gets. And honestly, we're going to get very wet in a moment. So I suggest we go, let's start at the bottom and work our way up and let's explore the machine that is the water mill. OK, let's go inside then, out of the rain. Well, Peter, we've come into the main body of the mill now and it really, in effect, it's actually like walking into an engine, actually getting inside and seeing how it all works. Now, we're going to get you to, to fire it up in a moment, but first of all, you were saying that this... Um, end of the building here was originally a different mill as well. There was also a water wheel here that, that ran as, a, as an offset water wheel. Why, what's the big difference between a water wheel and the turbine? Why, what's the benefit for putting a turbine in and when would it have happened? The main benefit of the turbine was simply to produce more power. There were two water wheels here, in fact, not quite side by side. They were offset so that one was a little further back in than the other. Uh, they were undershot wheels and each one has been estimated made around about six horsepower. 
that gave the Miller 12 horsepower to work with. The turbine immediately gave them uh, something in the region of about 24 to 25 horsepower. They were really struggling to compete with big steam-powered late Victorian mills, and uh, which could, of course could be built anywhere, so you didn't have to be down by the water or on the top of a hill to get the, uh, the power that you needed. And of course, and you're saying um, that this was an undershot, the original wheels were undershots. Yeah. Um, difference between undershot and overshot, and I'm guessing the star, not a huge rise on it, has it? No, that's right. So most of the mills around here were undershot wheels, and uh, we have, in fact, the head of something in the region of about 4 foot 11 inches here on a normal day. Uh, so we couldn't bring water over the top of the, uh, the water wheel. It had to rush underneath and, in effect, turn the wheel backwards. And uh, they were always the least efficient of water wheels. Um, the turbine also had one or two other uh, advantages, the main one being that, for the very first time, they could put a flywheel into the system. So uh, once you've got a big flywheel, this is a two-ton flywheel here, and that kept everything working at a nice steady pace. And of course, uh, that improved the output of the mill. Well, I think, Peter, there's a lot of mechanics going on, a lot of engineering going on. And I think the best thing is probably to see it actually fire up and then we can run through it as it comes up through and all the different systems kick into action. Yes, OK. So it only takes a couple of minutes. So uh, let's get going. Let's give that a try. Couple more turns. Off. Well, Peter, it looked as though you did that more by eye than anything. Uh, yes, that's right. It depends entirely on the levels of the water. Um, normally, I give it about uh, 25, 26 turns, and then um, I feel it stiffen up. And at that stage, I give it about another seven turns, and away we go. So, judging the volume to create the amount of power that you require, that's really just something you learn, you just, just by experience? Yes, what I've been doing is lifting a sluice gate at the very back of the mill there, and that allows water to come into the turbine, and um, the more water you let into the turbine, the quicker it'll go, or the more power you're producing. And um, so, uh, normally, uh, for a steady tick over like this, um, it gives, as I say, about uh, 20 to 30 turns. Now, you said, as you said, the turbine is, is, uh, is on the level, really. How does the turbine work? Uh, basically, the water comes through from the back of the mill, where there's a head of about five feet. That causes water pressure low down underneath our feet here. And so as I turn this wheel, I'm lifting a sluice gate. Water pressure behind the sluice gate forces its way through, swirls around in a huge casing. And as it swirls around in the casing, it's like making an artificial whirlpool. And uh, inside the middle of this whirlpool are blades. And as the, world, uh, as the water swirls around, it pushes the blades around. And that's what drives the mill. And we can see it, the power coming up through now. And then, as you said, you started to describe uh, the crown wheel and pinion up there. A, a bit like a diff, really. That, that's right. And uh, that's driving a shaft which goes through to the far end of the mill, which in turn drives some hammer mills through there. And then the main shaft is extended further up through. It disappears up through the ceiling here. And there's another crown wheel above just like a diff, as you say, and uh, that drives a lay shaft, which in turn drives a lot more machinery on the next floor. There's a heck of a lot to explore. We will go and have a quick look in a minute. But for now, I want to go back to the, the crown wheel itself, because uh, you told me earlier on that the, the teeth on the, t the teeth, <laughs> the teeth on the crown wheel are, are, are made of wood, apple wood. That's right. That's so that the miller had a stress point in the uh, machinery so that if anything jammed up one of the machines that was being driven, uh, there was no way in suddenly stopping the turbine. So one finished up with one end of the machinery stopped and the other end going. So it uh, meant that something somewhere had to give. And, a, a safety uh, factor. Yeah, that's, that's right. And so... Um, uh, it would be these wooden teeth which would uh, take the strain and would be sheared off 
The miller could then stop the mill, sort out the machine that was giving him trouble, and then um, knock out all the broken teeth, knock in a whole set of new ones, smear them with oil, and probably in a couple of hours he had everything working again. That's quite well, amazing. <laughs> The alternative, of course, was that if they were metal and got sheared off, then it had to be uh, a matter of contact a foundry. Foundry had to find a pattern, make a casting, send it here. That wouldn't have been two hours. That would have been probably two months before he had his machinery working again. Now, we've also got the flywheel, etc., and we've got a, a massive belt. What would the belt have been made of? And how do you make sure that it stays on that wheel? Originally, the belts were um, made of leather, but uh, these days they are made of several layers of canvas stuck together. Um, the only way that it's kept on the wheel is by when we look at the very edge of the wheel, we can see that it's very slightly bowed out, and that's what holds the, um, that's what holds the canvas in place uh, as it goes round. One would think perhaps that it should be hollow instead of bowed, but the bow seems to keep the belt uh, fixed in its normal position without, uh, without dropping down. The mystery of physics, I think. I, th I think so, yes. It, it, uh, I don't quite understand it myself, but as long as it works, I don't mind. <laughs> well, this is really just the start of it. Um, we have been and had an explore around the mill, so uh, I think we should head off and uh, show everybody exactly how a mill works, what it's capable of producing, and how that volume of water comes in and just creates so many outlets for power. Yeah. Yes, so uh, in effect, this is the engine room. This is where it all starts. Um, in turning the wheel here and, uh, and opening the sluice gate, everything begins to work and the whole of the machinery throughout the mill starts working. Well, Peter, that's a beautiful sound, isn't it? That's the mill of the running. It sounds good. Yes, that's the rhythm of the mill as it starts work. Well, Peter, the mill's up and running. Peter, the miller's on site. The farmer's just arrived. What's he going to be bringing in for you to mill today? Well, uh, what he brings in goes through the mill twice. It's usually uh, a, some type of wheat, and uh, if we're going to make flour, it's nearly always a hard wheat. So here, this is what happens when it comes into the mill. We bring it in, and it looks like this. It has various bits of st uh, straw and husk, occasionally stones, and um, sometimes we have snail shells, bird's feathers, um, sweet wrappers, almost anything that might be in front of the combine harvester. So it's been checked for its moisture content and it's been checked for uh, any microorganisms which might be living in the grain, which is very unlikely, uh, and it then goes through the mill twice. It's hauled to the top of the mill and uh, drops through a machine called a winnower, and that takes out all the rubbish for us so that we finish up with grain which looks like this. Um, all the husk and straw has been taken out. We have a few bits of husk in here, but since we're making stone ground wholemeal flour, a few husks don't matter because that will actually add a little bit of uh, extra fibre to uh, the contents of the flour that we make. A bit of texture. bit of texture, a <laughs> bit of extra texture, yeah. Um, um, where are we going to actually end up then? Uh, so it goes through, the to through to the top of the mill. Gravity feeds it down through a machine called a winnower, as I say, finishes up on the ground floor here, goes back to the top of the mill again as clean grain, and then comes down through the millstones to be ground into flour. And uh, this is the flour that we make. Now that's wholemeal flour then? So this is wholemeal flour, and although it looks quite white, when it's baked it will make a, a lightish brown loaf. Well, let's see where we start. We've got a sacks come in, whopping great sack. We've now got to get it up to the top, I think, haven't we? That's right. <laughs> and uh, we use the, the water power to run the mill and to uh, hoist our sacks. Excellent. So let's go and have a look. Well, the sacks coming in, I mean, they're, they're no mean weight themselves, and to lug them in's bad enough. But how on earth are we going to move these around the building, Peter? Well, as you say, the sacks were enormous. This is a typical sack from the old days and uh, it was often called a two and a quarter sack because it held two and a quarter hundredweights, um, bringing that a little bit more up to date. That was 18 stones or 114 kilos and that makes it something in the region of four and a half times what you're allowed to lift in the workplace these days. So. Uh, these sacks were brought in from a wagon outside on the miller's back, brought in here, but they had to go to the top of the mill. 
middle, the mill worked on the principle that uh, you balanced the power from the water uh, against gravity. So the power from the water operated the machinery and did the lifting for you. Gravity dropped everything back down again. So these sacks had to go right to the top of the mill. It's amazing because the whole structure is working literally from top to bottom on gravity. Yes, yes, that's correct. And so all the miller had to do was to pull down on this cord and we get a chain and we do that. So we get a loop. Here we have a sack. The loop goes around the neck of the sack, pulls up tight, and then all we do is pull down on that again. And away goes the sack. That is absolutely amazing. I can't believe and it you're doing the same movement but one's long and one's short I can't wait to see how that works um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to explore this right at the top of the mill so let's move on to see as it comes down on its first trip round and we'll work our way up through the floors I think okay we'll do we'll do just that Well, Peter, I've got to say, it's actually quite spooky up here, really, isn't it? <laughs> yes, we're right up under the roof now, and uh, um, it is rather cramped, as you can see, and uh, these very old beams do, send, uh, do tend to uh, give us uh, quite, a, as you say, a spooky feeling up here. And, uh, the feeling of re You get a feeling up here of the real age of the mill, I think, uh, the full 450 years of, uh, uh, since it was last rebuilt. Amazing. Now, the sack's also arrived. It's a lot easier than carrying it, so it's come up on this fabulous, almost Heath Robinson system to get it right to the top. What happens to it next from here? Well, we uh, have to lower it first, like so, um, otherwise you can't take it off the chain. We then, we then take it off the chain and take it to the far bin to pour it into a, uh, a small hopper inside the bin, and that leads on down into the winnower. I'll let you do that, Peter, because I'm standing square where I am and not budging. It's quite... You get a bit of vertigo up here, to be honest. Now, Peter, you were saying a little bit earlier on that the, the bins, um, well, let me gather down this end again, um, the bins individual, uh, not just to spread the weight, but there was a very good reason for that too, wasn't there, to do with each individual person's grain? That's right. Um, uh, a farmer was very proud of the fact that he had harvested his grain at just the right moment, so uh, he wanted his grain kept separate from any other farmers. Um, that meant that the miller couldn't just throw everything in together. And of course, there were different types of grain and so on uh, bringing into the mill. So uh, there was quite a, a difficult job for the miller to keep all the different types of grain separated and all the different uh, uh, different farmers' types of grain separated. Must have been a bit like spinning plates, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so, yes. Um, but uh, each farmer, of course, had his own pride in his own grain. And uh, the farmers brought their grain in and it was weighed in and the, uh, the output, whether it was animal food or whether it was flour, was weighed out again. And so the farmer wanted his own grain back in the form of uh, food or, uh, or flour. And um, so the miller had to keep everything separate up here. Uh, as you can imagine, if you were a farmer and you brought your grain in, um, you didn't want it mixed up with my old rubbish from up the road. And, uh, and I was a farmer who felt that having uh, waited another couple of weeks before I harvested it, mine was in better condition than yours. So I didn't want it mixed in with your old rubbish. So, you know, the, all that uh, weighed down on the miller um, in order to try and work out which bin to use and how to use them and which order 
to think of this one. It's getting more complex. But the one thing that I do love is while we're up in the eaves here, these fabulous A-frames and, and, and crooks, it's beautiful. Uh, but this is where the secret of your sack pulley is. So do you want to show us how that works? Oh, I can indeed, and it's very simple, really. So we hoist the grain up with um, a simple hoist at the end here. It has two basic characteristics, and that is that the chain drum in the center will both move slightly towards the window and back from uh, where we're standing, and it's also basically freewheeling. So when I pull on the cord, what I'm doing is lifting a heavy iron bar lever. And uh, as I pull the cord and lift the lever, the lever pushes the chain drum a little bit towards the window and that frees it from a brake block. As soon as it's off the brake block, being freewheeling, the weight of the chain will take the whole thing downstairs. So a little pull and it'll start going down. When I let go of the cord, there's enough weight in the heavy iron bar lever to drop down and pull the chain drum back against the brake block and that jams up everything. So the you can't get a runaway sack crashing back down through the mill and injuring anyone. Well, that was my bit, yeah. Those, the weight of those sacks, uh, you really needed that braking system. Mm. I was going to say that would be my big concern. Is, and the more we go around this mill, it's quite dangerous, really. But there are some amazing safety features in there. Uh, yes, there are. And um, that, is, that, of course, is one of them, that you couldn't get a runaway sack crashing back down through the mill. When you pull, give a longer pull on the cord, what's happening is that you're simply lifting the lever higher and that pushes the whole drum a little bit further towards the window from as we're standing that brings it into contact with the constantly moving drive wheel and that drives the drum around the other way and hauls the chain back up again so if we do it slowly first of all the drum comes off the brake block and the uh, freewheeling allows the dr chain to drop we keep pulling chunk as the wheels come together and now we've got drive and we're pulling the sack back up again as simple as that. I tell you, well, I said earlier on Heath Robinson, it's not, it's incredible. And to be able to design and figure all this out in those days, you know, we think we're cutting edge technology, but cracky, they really did have it sussed then, didn't they? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, there behind us here is another very, very simple uh, form of safety. These funny old leather hinges on the flaps which come up. If I demonstrate this, those big sacks, those big sacks came up through here and of course on the end of a chain, by the time they got to this height, they were swaying. So not only did they push these up, but often swaying, they pushed the flaps beyond the upright position. But the leather means that there was enough spring there to push the flaps back down again. Had they been on ordinary hinges, once they got past the upright position, they'd flop open. This wasn't here in the old days, so there's a danger of someone stepping back and going 15 feet down onto the floor below. So uh, Amazing. Yeah, and these old pieces of leather, some of them are simply some of the bits of strapping which originally drove the machinery. One or two of them have got bits of stitching on them, and they're almost certainly from horse's harness, uh, which broke as the horses strained to pull the heavy carts back up the mill lane. Well, Peter, the sack's come down. We've got, or rather, we've got the sack right to the top now. We've emptied yeah. it into the bins on the very top floor, on the bin floor. It's now coming back down to the stone floor, I believe this is called, and into That's the right. winnower. That's right, it is the stone floor. And uh, over here we have the winnower, which is a wooden machine, probably 1930s. And uh, grain comes down into a box on the top, and under the box there's a roller. So as the grain goes over the roller, a fan in the back blows out all the very lightweight stuff which is mainly husk and um, bits of dust and so on uh, that simply gets blown straight out onto the floor then everything else drops onto the top sieve from a series of sieves which go down through the machine and the top ones have holes in to let the grain fall through so anything bigger than the grain sits on the sieve works its way to the end drops down a, a gap and then finishes up in a bucket on the side uh, as the grain filters down through the machine, uh, it goes down through several sets of um, sieves and then eventually towards the bottom the sieves have small holes in but they're also slanting. So the good grain rolls off the sieves and goes out the far end of the machine and falls down through a gap in the floor down into a sack. 
In the meantime, anything smaller than that grain goes through the small holes and drops out into the second bucket that we have over there. And so, uh, what so, so it takes out both the uh, um, particles which are larger than the grain and any particles which are smaller than the grain. Uh, uh, the particles larger than the grain are the husks and the straw and so on that we saw fairly uh, easily uh, earlier on. Um, the particles that are smaller than the grain are sometimes undersized grain. We get quite a lot of that. Uh, very tiny particles which are not made any good for grinding. And also any seeds of uh, uh, things like poppies or groundsel or anything else which has sprung up in the, in the crop. That's really, really clever. That's, that's literally <laughs> separating yes. all uh, the crud from the goods. Absolutely, yes. And then, uh, of course, that's all collected downstairs, brought back up through this floor again, right up into the top of the mill, and it goes through the same process to go down through the, the millstones. So we're literally doing a snake up and down through the mill as we yes. go? Yes, that's right. Well, this is where we find out what a bat, a hopper, a horse, a shoe and a damsel have all got in common, Peter. This is your final uh, grinding of the grain, isn't it? That's right. This is the real heart of a mill, really, the millstones. And uh, we can see the top stone spinning around there, which is uh, all very well, but we've got to uh, understand how the grain gets into it. So basically over the top, we have uh, a wooden thing called a horse, which holds everything together. When I'm ready to uh, mill, I allow the grain to drop down through the sleeve at the back there, and it comes down into a hopper. The hopper has a hole in the bottom, which is about two inches square and that drops grain into a thing which you can just about see wobbling about over there. That's known as a shoe. The shoe is not much, much more than a couple of pieces of wood put together edge to edge, and it's hung on strings so it's loose. And that means that um, uh, it can be wobbled. Right in the middle there, there's a black bar, and that's called a damsel. And that damsel has three notches on, and as they spin round, they rattle against the shoe and make the shoe vibrate. Uh, so uh, as the damsel works, it vibrates the shoe. The shoe is set by the cord on the end so that it's slightly tilted downwards. The grain rolls down the shoe from the hopper and it comes out of the hole that the damsel goes through and drops right down into the very, very centre of the stones goes through the top stone because it has a hole in the centre but it can't go through the bottom stone because the spindle driving this comes up through there and the hole of the bottom stone, the bedstone as it's called, is blocked by what's known uh, as a neck box which is basically uh, the miller's term for the bearing which holds everything together there. And uh, so the grain then cannot go then any further so it begins to spread out. As it spreads out it gets underneath this stone once it's under the stone, the weight of the stone crushes and grinds the grain down to make it into flour. And the fact that the stone is spinning gives centrifugal force, so that throws the grain come flour into larger and larger circles until it eventually comes out inside this big wooden ton um, and builds up inside there. When the grain uh, has been ground into flour and it uh, falls out inside the ton, it, begin, it uh, builds up to about two or three inches deep, and by the time it's that depth, the spinning stone begins to drag it round inside the ton, and as it drags round, it comes over a hole, which is uh, just below us here, and that hole drops down through and uh, finishes up in a sack at the bottom, so that's where the, grain, uh, the, so that's where the flour falls down through. That's amazing. It's such an intricate piece of equipment as well, isn't yes. it? And, well, and yet, um, you know, once you set this up in the morning and you get the quality of flour that you want, um, you can walk away and leave it and it'll just go on working all day long. Now one thing I've noticed is, just while we're here very quickly, there's a lot of belts operating all of the time. So you wouldn't necessarily be using every piece of equipment, but every piece is operating. Whenever you switch it on, yes. you kind of can't select, can you? No, that's true. There are no gears to, uh, or clutches to throw it out of gear in any way. Everything is operating all the time, but uh, all these machines are designed to work empty as well as full. So uh, there's no real problem with that. So you could be doing animal feed, you could be doing flour, yes. but all the machines for all those uh, examples of grain. We, we could do everything all the time, yes. Yeah. And, and the water provides that enormous amount of torque, that phenomenal amount of power. 
uh, transmitted uh, through a shaft the other side of the wall here, uh, along this lay shaft which lies behind me here, and then the belts attached to that drive all the machinery. So it, it, it spreads throughout the mill. And as we said, when we first started this tour around, it's like being inside the actual engine workings of any machine, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's, it's like having a giant Meccano set, which you can actually crawl inside and, uh, uh, and uh, see how it works and also adjust the works as it's going along, yes. There's one thing I want to do is pop down very quickly because we can see it when it comes out into its sacks downstairs. And also I want to know how you adjust all, all the, to, to accommodate the different grains. Let's pop downstairs again and go and have a look and see how that works. Yes, just as the flour and the, uh, the grain and the flour would go up and down the mill, we're going up and down the mill constantly, yes. Well, Peter, having had the head for heights tested and certainly the fitness tested running up and down, we're almost at the final stage. Uh, back down here now on the meal floor with these fabulous, the underside of the grinding wheels, and finally the flour's going to arrive down here, hopefully in a very beautiful state. Yes, we certainly hope so. Uh, yes, what you can see here is that uh, if we look up underneath here, in the ceiling we'll see the huge great round stone, which is the lower stone or bed stone of the two uh, that uh, are making our flower. Um, the ones that are up here are what we call peaks. In other words, they're peak stones from the Peak District and uh, in the Derbyshire area. And uh, they seem to do quite a good job for us. Then... Um, uh, but the old millers in the old days preferred French stones and uh, behind you against the wall is uh, one of our uh, one simple example of a French burr stone over there and it's whilst the peak stones were one huge stone cut straight out of the quarries the French burr stones are actually made up of about 12, 13, 14 different pieces which had to be carefully cut, fitted together and then bound round with big iron bands to make sure that they didn't fly apart when they spun. I think most of us always thought it was um, good old granite and things but uh, local stone was used as well sometimes was it? Oh yes and I'm, I'm told if you look at skeletons from three or four hundred years ago they're um, their uh, side teeth are actually ground down much more than ours are and that was because local stone often wasn't terribly suitable for millstones and, and uh, so the flour had an awful lot more stone in it than it does these days. But, but that's where the stone goes. Um, everything that wears off of a millstone goes into the flour. There's no, there's no way of avoiding that. Gives it a whole new meaning to rock bun, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah, that's right. So we've come down, we can see, again, for adjustments and things, how do we go about it? Because you well, get different grain sizes, so very quickly, how do we run through the final stages yeah. to make sure you're grinding to the right size? Well, when I'm uh, uh, about to start milling, I let the grain start falling down between the stones. The <laughs> stones are usually set in this mill when they're just ticking over like this with about a centimetre between them. And uh, so I let the grain start falling between between the stones, then I come down here, down again, <laughs> and, as I'm, yeah, and uh, turn this little wheel in here, and as I turn that wheel, it brings the whole spindle down, and that brings the top stone down with it, until it begins to grind against the lower stone. So we let the grain in first, and then we drop the stone into the grain. Um, as soon as I've done that, um, some of the... Uh, some of the output of the stones will start coming down through this little sleeve here and drops down at the end. So I then stick my hand underneath here, see what's coming out of the sleeve. I uh, have a look at it, test its uh, quality and um, adjust the wheel here to make it finer if necessary. And, um, and then once I'm happy with the quality of the flour that's coming out, I can just walk away and leave it. And it'll just keep coming on down through all day long. So let's just have a quick look at the final flower, then let's see what graded grains make. There we are in this mill. This is stone ground, this is stone ground wholemeal flour, and um, it's got a little bit of husk in it, which is ground up to make a little bit more uh, um, uh, fibre inside the, uh, the flour here, but uh, it's good quality stuff, and it's nice and fine, and uh, we pack it up put it into bags like this and uh, and sell it. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. And as they say, graded grains make finer flour. Very beautiful stuff indeed. Absolutely glorious. But you can do all sorts of different types of grains and flours? Um, it is quite possible. Although with the single set of stones that we have here, we do tend to keep to this type of flour all the time. So this in the old days is where all the administration was done. Um, this wasn't water powered. This had to be done by hand. 
Uh, one or two interesting things. We've got uh, an old ledger here which uh, goes back from uh, 1890s and amazingly they were sending out bills of over 40 pounds in those days so that must have been an awful lot of money but uh, this is where everything was kept and this is a particularly special uh, old writing desk for me because in here we have my grandfather who signed himself in, Harry Elkins, who came here in 1894 as a lad of 14 and he worked in the mill all his life. Um, the only time he left here was to do an apprenticeship and he came back in 1904 uh, and eventually retired from this mill in 1946. And here he signed himself in and uh, here it says that he came back on uh, August the 23rd, 1904. So that's when he'd finished his apprenticeship and was then a fully-fledged miller. So that's a rather special as far as I'm concerned. Well, I have to say, Peter, for, uh, for you and the team, on behalf of everybody, I think, in the country, because these mills are so, so very important. And if it wasn't for people like you, we would lose them. And as we said right at the very start, the mills were the instruments of the day. They were the factories at the start of the Industrial Revolution, really, weren't they? They were indeed, and, and all run by water power or, alternatively, wind power, uh, all for free. Exactly. And that is what's so crucial, is that we keep that side of our social history. If it wasn't for people like you, we would have lost places like this many, many years ago. And I think that a, a huge thank you. We're all indebted to you for looking after, preserving, and keeping these places working, and then taking the time and the trouble to explain it to us. So thank you so very much, Peter Lusmott, and the rest of the team here at Sturminster Newton. It's an amazing job you've done. Thanks very much indeed, and uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. Well, we look forward to celebrating a thousand years with you next year.